Nowadays, animated Disney movies are a surefire recipe for box office success. Unfortunately, in the past, even Disney has put out a few commercial duds. Here's the real reason why these animated Disney movies bombed at the box office. Fantasia was the passion project of Walt Disney himself. In fact, he was so in awe of the 1940 musical that he once said, Fantasia is timeless. It may run 10, 20, or 30 years. It may run after I'm gone. Fantasia is an idea in itself. I can never build another Fantasia. I can improve. I can elaborate. That's all. Sadly, Walt's passion failed to translate into initial massive box office returns. The film's first screenings at a roadshow engagement didn't turn a profit thanks to the expensive costs of setting up the sound system known as Fantasound, which was intended for use in theaters showing Fantasia. Those costs meant that Fantasia was always going to struggle to turn a profit. On top of that, the avant-garde nature of the feature initially turned off general moviegoers and even some critics. In the end, Fantasia lost Disney the modern equivalent of more than $15 million and nearly drove the company into bankruptcy. While Fantasia initially proved to be too costly and unusual to be successful right away, the film would find itself profitable decades later. A 1969 theatrical re-release saw Fantasia finally turning a profit, while a subsequent re-release in 1990 took in $25 million. So despite bombing in its first theatrical run, Fantasia did indeed live up to Walt Disney's hopes of running long after he was gone. Today, Sleeping Beauty is seen as one of the jewels in Disney's crown. But during its initial 1959 release, the movie was nothing more than an outright box office dud. The film cost $6 million to produce and brought in a little more than $5 million. Thanks to Sleeping Beauty, Walt Disney Productions lost money between 1959 and 1960 for the first time in a decade. Popular explanations for the project's struggles to initially connect with viewers are its distinct animation style, as well as a negative reception to the scariness of the movie's villain, Maleficent. It's also hard to imagine any film in 1959 making much money with a budget as high as $6 million. For example, the second highest grossing film of 1959 was The Shaggy Dog, with a $9.6 million domestic haul, which clearly demonstrates that any 1959 film would struggle to turn a profit when it cost as much as Sleeping Beauty. This box office performance lent an initial negative tinge to Sleeping Beauty's reputation, but it wouldn't be there for long. Further theatrical re-releases in 1979 and 1986 helped to restore the film's box office reputation, and the latter re-release managed to gross an impressive $15 million domestically. The Black Cauldron was supposed to kick off a whole new era of animated Disney filmmaking. Channeling the darker tone of 1980s fantasy movies rather than more classic Disney fare, the movie was a departure from the norm of what animated Disney movies could be. In execution, however, The Black Cauldron ended up being a box office disaster for the studio. Grossing just $21 million domestically on a $44 million budget, The Black Cauldron's box office was so meager that it was outgrossed by the Care Bears movie. In 2010, Slate would dub The Black Cauldron the movie that almost killed Disney animation. Among the chief reasons the film failed to connect with audiences was that early reviews made a point of emphasizing just how dark and scary it was. This ensured that the project turned away its primary demographic, kids and their parents. The Black Cauldron also suffered financially because it was greenlit by Disney executives who were gone by the time the repeatedly delayed project was released, with the new executive team being nowhere near as invested in the movie's production. The first sequel in the Walt Disney Animation Studios canon, The Rescuers Down Under, took the lead characters of The Rescuers to the Australian Outback. Giving the rescuers an adventure in Australia was meant to capture the box office power of then-recent Australian hits such as Crocodile Dundee. Unfortunately, the rescuers down under didn't have a good day at the box office, with a measly $27.9 million domestic haul. Part of the problem Down Under faced was that by the time it came out in November 1990, American audiences' fascination with Australia was waning. It had already been two years since Crocodile Dundee 2 came out, and even that made less than its predecessor. It had also been 13 years since the original Rescuers premiered, so fans weren't exactly clamoring for a sequel by that point. A bigger problem for Rescuers Down Under, however, was that it had to face off against the family movie juggernaut Home Alone in its opening weekend. That live-action feature soared financially, taking in $285 million over its domestic gross. Rescuers Down Under couldn't even hit 10% of that gross in its domestic run. 
After a dismal opening weekend, Disney Animation head Jeffrey Katzenberg ordered all Rescuers Down Under marketing to be pulled. This of course ensured that the movie couldn't develop legs in the long run, and pretty much killed its chances at the box office. During the early 1990s, Walt Disney Animation Studios was nigh on unstoppable. Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and The Lion King were all gigantic hits, each one bigger than the last. But the hot streak started to fizzle after The Lion King, with Pocahontas making noticeably less than the previous two Disney Animation efforts. This problem had worsened by 1997 when Hercules prominently signaled that Disney had lost some of its box office strength. Grossing $97 million domestically, Hercules became the first Disney animation title to gross under $100 million domestically since The Rescuers Down Under in 1990. What? Okay, fine, fine, I'm cool, I'm fine. Just three weeks after the film's initial release, Disney was claiming that increased competition from fellow summer 1997 blockbusters like Men in Black was to blame for the movie's underperformance. However, an unnamed Disney insider told the New York Times that Hercules' box office woes could be attributed more to the fact that it only appealed to young children rather than audiences of all ages. Worse still, Hercules has never really worked as a brand name in Hollywood, with more modern releases such as The Legend of Hercules and Brett Ratner's Hercules also struggling to make money at the box office. Sadly, it seems like Hercules just never stood a chance. Nearly 60 years after its initial release, Fantasia received a sequel in the form of Fantasia 2000. After a limited concert release, Fantasia 2000 debuted exclusively in IMAX on January 1st, 2000. It was followed by a more traditional release that summer. Over its opening weekend, Fantasia 2000 took in $2.2 million from just 54 theaters. Unfortunately, that excellent box office wouldn't be replicated when it was given a wider release six months later. Fantasia 2000 eventually grossed $60.8 million domestically on an $80 million budget. The fractured release method of Fantasia 2000 doubtlessly hurt the movie's chances at the box office. Although it was meant to be an event you had to see in a theater, Fantasia 2000 couldn't keep up its event status in the six-month period between its IMAX debut and its general release. Put simply, what was a classy must-see in December 1999 had become old news by June 2000. There's also the fact that Fantasia has always been a fairly niche Disney property. It's not exactly by the numbers children's entertainment, and that meant Fantasia 2000 was always going to struggle to compete against more conventional family-friendly fare released in the summer of 2000 like Disney's own dinosaur. During production, crew members working on Atlantis The Lost Empire wore t-shirts that carried the phrase, fewer songs, more explosions. This piece of crew merch perfectly embodied how Atlantis was planned as a radical departure from the usual Disney fare. Indeed, Atlantis was a straight-up action-slash-adventure film, with set pieces taken right out of a Ray Harryhausen film. While its character designs evoked the art of Mike Mignola more than the traditional visuals of other Disney movies. All these unique qualities, however, couldn't quite help Atlantis stand out at the box office. Grossing just $84 million domestically on a $90 million budget, Atlantis became only the second post-1990 animated Disney movie to be released in the summertime and gross under $100 million domestically. More than anything, Atlantis' failure can be traced back to another family-friendly cartoon from the summer of 2001. Layers! Onions have layers! Yes, the runaway success of DreamWorks Shrek combined with middling reviews for Atlantis meant that Disney's hopes of winning the 2001 summer box office battle were ogre before they began. Disney Animation had endured its fair share of box office duds long before Treasure Planet sailed into theaters, but none were ever quite as fatal as this. Released in November 2002, Treasure Planet opened to a dismal $12.1 million and grossed just $91.8 million worldwide on its massive $140 million budget. The film was widely seen as a herald for the demise of hand-drawn animation, while its box office performance proved so momentously awful that the Los Angeles Times later declared it one of the costliest box office flops in history. Ever since the release of Oliver and Company in 1988, animated Disney movies had frequently reigned supreme over the Thanksgiving holiday. So why was Treasure Planet such a massive bomb? Screenwriter Terry Rossio, who wrote Treasure Planet's story, opined that turning Treasure Island protagonist Jim Hawkins into a teenager for Treasure Planet alienated audiences. Meanwhile, November 2002 was packed 
with family films, including the Santa Claus 2 and Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, meaning the competition was even tougher than usual. Another pressing issue was that Treasure Planet was coming hot off a series of action-packed, hand-drawn animated movies that had also flopped, like Titan AE and of course Atlantis The Lost Empire. Put all that together, you're on a course for a genuine disaster. At the time of its release, 2004's Home on the Range was a truly historic movie. This animated western was intended to be the last Disney feature produced in hand-drawn animation, and every movie from that point onward would use computer animation instead. Sadly, Home on the Range didn't send out Disney's era of hand-drawn animation in a blaze of glory as the movie grossed just $50 million domestically. Home on the Range's release was plagued with a number of issues, including the fact that it came out in early April. The biggest Disney animation titles had always been released in either summertime or at Thanksgiving. Then there's the fact that Home on the Range faced competition from another family movie, Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed. Those problems could have been overcome if Home on the Range had generated positive reviews, but the film received mixed marks from critics, with a 53% Rotten Tomatoes critics rating a far cry from the acclaim that had greeted the Disney movies of the previous decade. Without any positive buzz to buoy it, Home on the Range became yet another casualty of the dark days of Disney animation. Since 2005, every single feature from Walt Disney Animation Studios has made at least $97 million domestically. The lone exception to that rule, however, is the 2011 feature Winnie the Pooh, which made just $26.6 million. Pooh's box office woes could be attributed in part to what can only be described as Pooh fatigue. No bother. Double bother. Between 2000 and 2005, a trio of Pooh movies hit the big screen, each making less than its predecessor. Even with Winnie the Pooh being the first to be made by Walt Disney Animation Studios in nearly 35 years, moviegoers just weren't interested in seeing more of A.A. A. Milne's silly old bear on the big screen. Then again, perhaps moviegoers would have been keener on Winnie the Pooh if it had received a more favorable release date. The movie was released domestically on July 15, 2011, putting it smack dab in between a number of huge kids' movies. Three weeks prior, Disney's own Cars 2 debuted, while two weeks later the Smurfs would hit theaters. Worse yet, Pooh opened against Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, which scored the biggest opening weekend in history at the time. The saddest thing of all is that Winnie the Pooh actually received some of the best reviews of any major movie released in summer 2011. Facing off against Wizards, Cars, and Smurfs, however, poor old Pooh Bear just didn't stand a chance. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.